बिल्कुल सर बिल्कुल ओके ग्रेट शोभन दाद कैन वी बिगिन ओके टेरिफिक सो फ्रेंड्स आई एम रियली डिलाइटेड दैट वी हैव इन आवर मिड्स टुडे डॉक्टर शोभन दास गुप्ता आई विल बी इंट्रोड्यूसिंग हिम ब्रीफली बट आई वांट टू से दैट ही इज मच मोर देन व्हाट ही हैज बीन डिस्क्राइब्ड एज द फॉरमोस्ट इंडियन कंजर्वेटिव राइटर आई हैव दिस बुक right in front of me it's a remarkable book called awakening bharat mata and my copy is dog eared quite a bit uh incidentally uh, this book uh the preface starts with ayodhya and uh, the book makes the point that 1991 he quotes the economists if i remember right and he says that 1991 is an inflection moment for the republic so uh, i'll talk a little more about this book but uh what i really want to say is that in some ways we are uh witnessing the birth of uh, what we might call the new republic in india not only the uh, 370 uh, if not uh, abrogation at least uh, alteration as well as the uh, you know shilanyas of the uh, grand ram mandir i think they mark two very important moments in our history as an independent nation Uh, in just a couple of days we are going to celebrate india's independence day once again the 73rd anniversary of our independence i believe and i think this is a remarkable time for the republic and as i've said earlier our activities at iias are not always so news driven but i guess these two events were so important that they shouldn't be passed uh unnoticed or unmarked is what we felt and so we already had a conversation on uh, kashmir and ladakh uh, just recently and now i'm happy that we're going to have this uh, very very special webinar on the ayodhya experience i want to say just a couple of words about shobanda uh you know uh, he's uh, as i said a remarkable thinker writer columnist journalist as well as member of parliament and he is a recipient of the padma bhushan if i'm not mistaken uh, uh dr das gupta had his early education at uh, la machinie in uh, in kolkata if i remember right and uh, then he he came to st stephen's college to do his ba honors in history after which he went to uh, to the uk and he got his masters and phd in history from soas uh the school of oriental and african studies in london which has got a history of producing very distinguished indian historians uh going back to i suppose al basham and he also spent some time at nuffield college at oxford among other achievements of his i think i should say that he was a very well known face on indian television still is uh and uh, has worked with the indian express india today a variety of uh, other Uh, i think respected uh, uh, platforms but what's really important is i think that he's the uh, you know one of the key proponents of uh, what we might call an indian conservatism now what does that mean in this book i if if you allow me i'll just uh, uh, quote from this book now uh, something i must say about this book which makes it remarkable it's not only a reader of some uh, you know very unusual pieces where an attempt has been made by shopunda as its editor to construct a tradition of indian conservative thought over the last 150 years so uh, it has it's a reader okay and it has some remarkable articles that we've completely forgotten ramanan chatterji for example the editor of modern review uh, uh, an amazing essay by atal bihari vajpay after the bhivandi riots so it has some really unique pieces in it but what makes the book really valuable to all of us as scholars is that it's got a extended introduction which goes uh, over 100 pages where shopanda is giving you his own view of of what this tradition actually means and uh, i just wanted to quote to you the 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 characteristics of indian conservatism as shopanda defines them now the first of these uh, is that uh, Uh, conservatives according to him are more attached to community wisdom 
than to individual choices. Now, I found this very profound because there's another book on Indian conservatives by Jaitirth Rao. You might have seen it. And, you know, he spends five pages trying to tell us that conservatives are those who are no changes but slow changes. And uh, they don't like radical and quick, uh, you know, um, um, you might say revolutionary changes in society. They're evolutionary than revolutionary. But I think that putting it in this manner, as Shapundar does, is far more, I think, uh, resonant with what we actually experience. And speaking about slow changes, evolution, I, I, I seem to remember that at one time, Shapundar was actually attracted to Trot, Trotskyist thinking, which was uh, not all that evolutionary, probably more revolutionary, but he could tell us more about that. But so first thing, community wisdom over individual choices. And he quotes Burke, uh, uh, who, who, who tells us, Burke says that only a fraction of human knowledge is codified. So, you know, civilizations like India live by an ancient constitution, which is not codified, but which is in the cultural matrix of the land. And speaking of Ayodhya, what is Ram Rajya, the idea of Ram Rajya, if it is not that ancient constitution, which even Gandhiji invoked over and over again to convey an idea of an alter nation, a different kind of nation. Okay, then the second uh, characteristic of conservatives, according to Shapanda, is the importance of the sacred in imagining national life. So the secular rational approach has its uses, of course, but for the conservative, uh, the idea of the nation, the idea of a civilization, is somehow deeply uh, entrammeled with the sacred geography and the sacred history of the land. So this is the second characteristic. Now, the third uh, feature of conservatism, according to him, is that the authority of the state is circumscribed, okay, by the will of the people, by the will of society on the one hand, and also conservatives do not like, you know, an overly interfering government when it comes to the economy, the management of the economy. He, he quotes Scruton there, that state's relation to the citizen is not and cannot be contractual alone. And finally, he says, conservatism per perceives itself as an embodiment of national identity. So once again, nationalism is back almost, you know, with a bang. Uh, all over the world, we see this upsurge of nationalism, and this book gives us a way to understand this. I, I want to end this introduction by mentioning another book that I just began to read, and it's, it's a book that has uh, got very good press. It's by Madhav Khosla, and I'm sure that uh, fellows in our midst who have uh, read this book, uh, and it's, it was published by Harvard, and it's called India's Founding Moment. The Constitution of a Most Surprising Democracy. So Khosla is concentrating on the importance of the Indian Constitution. Uh, and I think that we have to read uh, Shopanda's book in conjunction with this. I just want to put a couple of uh, statements that Khosla uh, in the epigraph of his book. He, he quotes uh, James Fitzwilliam, Fitzjames uh, Stevens on the foundations of of the government of India, I believe this is 1883. He says an Indian parliament or collection of Indian parliaments would produce undisguised, unqualified anarchy. Then there's another quotation from John Robert Seeley. The book is called The Expansion of England, 1883. The end of our Indian empire is perhaps almost as much beyond calculation as the beginning of it. There is no analogy in the history for one or the other. Now, the reason I have mentioned both these quotations is that uh, this miracle called Indian democracy, I, I believe, cannot be understood only in uh, the kind of contractual or constitutional terms that Madhav Khosla proposes. Uh, and there's also a wonderful quotation, uh, by the way, in the book. Let me see if I can uh, find it uh, from, from Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, he quotes Dr. Ambedkar as saying, constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. We must realize that our people have yet to learn it. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is 
essentially undemocratic. Now, this is a quotation from uh, Dr. Ambedkar. I believe that the answer to this quotation or the answer to those uh, James, uh, you know, Fitz James uh, uh, and others that I quoted, Seeley, uh, uh, Stevens and Seeley, the answer uh, is this kind of, uh, you might say, unwritten constitution of India, uh, you know, which this book, Awakening Bharat Mata, uh, I think, uh, elucidates and enunciates. I must say, uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that the book, the, I mean, the talk today talks about the Ayodhya experience, I believe, from the 80s to the present time. Uh, and uh, uh, I just wanted to say one last thing. I visited uh, Ayodhya twice, once uh, before the Babri Masjid was felled. I was there in September uh, 1992. And I think the mosque came down on 6th. December 1992. And then in 1995, I went again. And that time, the whole place was barricaded. You could not visit. I went to the Hanuman Gadi and other places. And I, I, had the, I had a tremendous experience then. And one more time in Orcha, when I learned that uh, Ram Lalla had been brought to Orcha from Ayodhya. So I believe that, uh, that the uh, sort of fight to regain Ayodhya is a very old one. It goes back to 1526 or so whenever Mir Baki and other, others uh, with him destroyed the, the temple underneath it. Uh, but I have uh, read somewhere that there were 76 battles to regain Ayodhya. 76. And Guru Gobind Singh also fought the Mughal forces to regain Ayodhya. And so what we've seen today is that unwritten constitution of India uh, you know, which is in the minds and hearts of a large majority of Indian people, uh, whose aspirations and wishes of almost 500 years have been answered, you know, not through a bloodbath in the streets, as we saw in Bangalore the other day, but really through judicial constitutional means. But with those words, once again, welcome uh, Dr. Shopun Das Gupta. Thank you, Shopun uh, And over to you. I just, I just wanted to say one last thing. You know, we, we break after 50 minutes, so uh, you have all the time in the world. If we get cut off, there's a second link, so we will resume the conversation. I just wanted to say that, and I apologize in advance for that uh, uh, technical problem. But, but over to you, Shopanda. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm muting my mic now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Makran, for inviting me to speak to the fellows of uh, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies. You know, the nearest thing I guess we have to all souls in um, in India. And um, it's obviously a wonderful setting and uh, an ideal place for academic pursuits. Now, obviously that's a bit daunting for my thing because I've, I've been slightly, I've been a refugee from academia for a rather long time. So maybe my language of discourse may not correspond with some of the uh, terms and idioms of maybe postmodernism, et cetera, which are so currently in vogue. Um, nevertheless, I shall attempt to uh, give my own perspective on what I consider the Ayodhya experience. And uh, it's, it's quite evident over the past few days, at least the past few weeks, that in the wake of the Bhumi Pujan on August the 5th, almost everyone in India, whether they were in favor of what happened or deadly opposed to what took place in Ayodhya at that time, everyone acknowledged the fundamental significance of this event. And I think that's right. Because it does mark, uh, it, it's, it's certainly a very important landmark in the evolution of Indian nationhood. It's an important landmark in the career of Indian democracy, of the Indian Republic. And in many ways, I think how we as a country, how we as a nation are going to move ahead in the coming days, in the coming decades, may and I use the word may, because I think there is nothing definitive about anything in history, uh, may 
uh, acknowledge that it, Ayodhya was an important milestone in that process. I'll start with a small anecdote, and it, it goes back to about 1990, when I happened to be in Ayodhya uh, for a purely journalistic purpose, and I came across this uh, rather well-known industrialist from Western India who happened to be there at the same time, and we met up, and we went inside the what what is popularly known as the Babri Masjid, and uh, we offered our prayers, etc., to Ram, to the idol of Ram Lala, which was situated there, and we came out, and then this gentleman said, "Okay, that's done. Now where is the mosque?" And uh, I think it was a telling comment because I think a lot of people understood, they were quite completely confused about the mosque, the temple, what the hell was happening. And I think there was a certain ambiguity about this whole Babri structure. Let's start from the very beginning, from the history of that process. And I think I'll explain what, what, what I mean by this ambiguity. First, as Makran explained earlier, this was a mosque which was constructed in 1528 by a general of Babur called Mir Baki. Over either an existing temple or what was a make of some sort of a shrine, which was regarded in popular belief as the birthplace of Ram. And so it was the exact place in where Ram was supposed to have been born. And so there was that first thing, the appropriation of a site which the locals held to be sacred. Now, this didn't necessarily mean that the site was lost forever. What was also quite amazing about it was that just outside the structure, on the perimeter, there was something called the Ram Chamutra. And the Ram Chamutra was the place where Hindus of our used to gather on a daily basis, sometimes on special occasions, etc. And that was the place they were off they gave their offerings to Ram because they were denied access to the inside, which had become a mosque. And it's sometimes those of you who've been to Jerusalem will recall the outer perimeter, the western wall of the old Temple of Mount, which is no longer in the possession of the Jews, but who offer their prayers and what is called the Wailing Wall. So this Ram Chabutra, in a very small and in a very localized sort of way, actually epitomized that same phenomena of a lost possession. And so they offered their prayers in that. So there was that ambiguity of a structure where, Mos where, prayer, where, uh, where Muslims were offering prayers inside on certain days and immediately outside were the Hindus who were, while offering their prayers, lamenting their loss at the same time. And this continued in this sort of fashion, and it continued in this fashion, marked, of course, by very, what uh, Makran was also reminded about, various attempts, whether it's 78 or not, is, is, is a matter of conjecture. Uh, but certainly numerous attempts, some violent, some through the legal means, to regain possession of that. site. Till in 1949, you developed another, another complication developed, which was that a mosque, which had virtually been abandoned by the locals there, um, local Muslims because of certain other factors, idols of Ram Lala were placed there in 
1949. And so you had this bizarre situation and which continued right up to 1991 of what seemed in the outward appearance to be a mosque, but inside was a functioning Ram temple. And I, and I em emphasize this ambiguity to say that I think it also tells us a little bit about the nature of the Indian Republic, of how it was evolving at that particular time. That those ambiguities were sort of symptomatic, they, they, they were a metaphor for some of the larger questions which were <coughs> which were uh, which preoccupied the minds of the nation in different ways then in 1991 following the demolition you had a completely makeshift temple you know four bamboo poles on top of it a tarpaulin and uh, underneath that this makeshift ram temple surrounded in subsequent days by a barricade where very few of the actual worshippers were allowed access and there were large numbers of restrictions put in, put in there. So again, you had a fledgling temple, a site which had been recovered, but nothing more could be done about it. That impasse was also personified in, there, in, that, uh, in, in that makeshift temple. Till we have this Bhumi Pujan now, when the formalization, the possession, the regaining of possession has been formalized, legitimized, legalized in every way, and a grand temple, which will probably come up in two to three years' time. Now, does this, the history of this structure, the history of what happened in Ayodhya in a very limited way, does it tell us something about what India, how it's evolved, etc., about it? Now, there has been a large amount, there has been a lot of breast beating that this is the end of the Republic as we have seen it. Some people would say this is the end of Indian civilization as we know it. But there is a large degree of concern in various quarters that India has changed unrecognizably from how it evolved in 1947. Now, we've deal with uh, these some of these questions in the context of what has happened in Ayodhya. Now, I think the first thing we have to note is that has Ayodhya fundamentally questioned the tenets of secularism as we know it? The answer is both yes and no. Secularism in India was an unwritten code of conduct which was in which defined the Indian Republic in various ways from 1947 to 1976 when the term secularism was actually injected into the preamble of the constitution in rather controversial and uh, murky circumstances which most of you know about considering what 1976 signified for the height of the emergency, and there was no real debate on that issue. Now, does that necessarily mean that between 1947, I mean, 1950, I'm sorry, when the, when the, Republic, uh, when the Constitution was enacted, to 1976, there was no secularism in India? This is a question which I think is very important and it's important to pose this question. I think that I think everyone would recognize that that is certainly not true. Whether the critics or these proponents or whatever shade of opinion would believe that that's certainly not true. What was there in the constitution of India was certain uh, principles. The most important principle which <coughs> was underlined in that was a that there is no such thing as a state religion. That was implicit. By not mentioning it, it was implied. But more important, there were certain provisions which ensured that the principle of non-discrimination of all faiths, that, that there would be no institutionalized discrimination against any, any individual, any community, 
on account of their faith beliefs. And in turn, certain rights and uh, privileges were granted to members of the minority. These included the right to run their own educational institutions, the right of preaching their religion, even the right implied of conversion. So secularism was, a, the, 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 the doctrine of secularism as we understood it was implicit in the Indian constitution rather than made explicit. There were certain principles and they adhered to what we call the separation uh, the, the, that, the, uh, that, that the state did, did not attach itself to any body of faith. At the same time, India was a deeply religious country and we as a country did not adhere to the French model of secularism, whereby all even symbols of faith was somehow seen to be outside the arena of legitimate uh, public activity, then they had to be conveyed in a private sphere altogether. So even that was not there. So it was a it was a different body of secular thought. Now the problem which happened in 1976, once this term was injected into the Indian Constitution, into the preamble of the Indian Constitution, was that, as you will notice, that prior to 1976. There had been sectarian tension in India in various ways, the partition being the partition of India and its aftermath being one of the most important. But these tensions very rarely got into the arena of the constitution. There were very rarely tensions. There were always think of local tensions, political tensions, etc. Now, after 1976, we had two things. Many of the conflicts, which fundamentally hadn't changed their nature, now became centered on this term secularism. And consequently, there was an attempt to codify secularism. And I think this was the most important thing which happened. This attempt of codification of a term which we had so far used as a byword for good sense, byword for commonly accepted, understood values of whatever we, 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 we understood them as. They were implicit, they were understood, and very rarely were they tried to be codified. So this codification problem was one of those, and it was attempted, you know, various times, Supreme Court was asked to adjudicate, and the judges did attempt various things. Uh, most of the time, not very satisfactorily, uh, various political scientists and political theories, theorists tried their hand at trying to explain what exactly secularism was supposed to mean. Uh, uh, more, more important, a lot of emphasis was attempted to think of what is not permissible under the constitution. So you had this conflict which grew in as a result of an attempted codification of Indian secularism. And I think half the problem really starts from this. And this Ayodhya comes in, in a time, the real, the, the issue is in Ayodhya, was not so much that a localized dispute in uh, our existed, had aroused passions over the years, over the centuries, to, for about three, 400 years, in various ways it had become a some sort of a local, localized flashpoint. But what exactly took place after 1988-89 was that an essentially local dispute, which was an emotive dispute and a very important symbolic dispute also, suddenly got to the fore and became a rallying point of a larger national movement. And I think that's worth uh, trying to comprehend why did the Ayodhya movement become national? And why did it go beyond the boundaries of Uttar Pradesh, maybe at best parts of the Hindi heartland? And I think it's got to do with these misgivings which were gradually, in, not very coherently articulated, but larger misgivings on the manner in which gradually 
secularism was sought to be codified and an entire body of what might be called civilizational assumptions was sought to be kept by and large marginal to the Indian, uh, in, in, to our republic, the values which we recognized in the republic. So that's a, to my mind, that, that was important to find out what the context was. Okay, there was certainly the definite political context. You know, people talk about the Shabanu, uh, <coughs> uh, reversal of the Shabanu judgment, which for the first time brought into uh, play terms such as minoritism, a, a term which certainly was singularly absent if you look at the period prior to 1976. Here you will find an injection of new term. You will find how the term pseudo secularism suddenly comes into play and enters the lexicon of Indian politics and acquires currency. It's not merely that it was used by a certain uh, L.K. Advani who first coined that term. It's not that. But and third point, which is very important, is the feeling of deprivation, the feeling of, of uh, being left out, which was one of the facets which was there in the Ram Chabutra worship you know, being excluded, being kept out of the main body, main structure, by force, by state power. Suddenly that feeling became more and more profound as the days went by. And it was believed for a very long time that the entire institutional weight of the Indian establishment, they define however you may want to call it, which included the judiciary, which included the parties, and most important, included a intelligentsia and those controlled intellectual capital in India. They had ganged up somehow to keep these sentiments. I think these we just lost Shapunda's voice, but have hopefully you, we'll you, get it can, right can you hear back. Me? Can, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Sorry, uh, as I said, the these various impulses. Can the others what? hear me at all? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your voice is also also audible. Okay. Uh, so I actually pre presume it's back to. Uh, I mean, I am being heard. Uh, Okay, so these various the different forms of impulses, which were there, had somehow been kept out of the reckoning as far as the Indian state was concerned. And this feeling of rejection was quite marked in the case of, of India. And what was also very profound in uh, what was also quite noticeable in this entire period between, say, 1989 and 91, and then subsequently, etc., the furious debates that went on in the, through the media, through the in academia, etc., was that the denial of the temple became the most important facet of what might be called the secular resistance to this, these impulses. It was not that necessarily on, on paper, it was being suggested that they let the matter be resolved by court as a simple property dispute. But when it came to court, it was marked by enormous degree of judicial prevarication. And that was understandable. Partly because the judges were quite clear in their minds that this is not an ordinary property dispute. It's not a question of who held the title to certain things. The questions involved were far greater and could necessarily never be resolved by simply a judicial pronouncement using law as the criterion. I think it was in the minds of the judges were quite clear in their minds, but at the same time, they never pronounced on it that look, this is beyond our jurisdiction. This is something which has to be resolved through by society itself, by the political forces, by a fair play, etc. 
And hence, you, you, you got this entire stalemate, which was there in India, of a judiciary which refused to pronounce on this for decades and decades and decades, till finally you got a pronouncement of sorts in 2010. And then you had the political parties washing their hands of it and saying, no, it is not our business, it is something else. So this stalemate, which continued along with this whole belief that somehow the majority community, and this is a very unique belief, that somehow the majority community in India, a very large section of it, suddenly felt shortchanged. And this was this feeling, again, that it doesn't, we are no longer in control of our destiny. It was this resentment which had a very, very important role to play. And ultimately, when you really look, look back on the resolution of this dispute by the Supreme Court in 2019, after the Chief Justice more or less said, look, it's going to be heard within three months. If you can give your arguments, it's there. Otherwise, you don't give your arguments. Bad luck to you. Put a guillotine on the hearing and fast track the process and pronounced what was ultimately not so much a legal, a judicial, it's not a legal judgment if you really look, look at it. It was the judgment of an arbitrator based not so much on law, but what he felt was common sense, what, well, what he felt were the values and what he thought, what they thought was good for society as a whole, as a way of ending this as once and for all. So I think this point has to be very, very clearly understood in various ways that this met attempt at conflict resolution, which was there, was not centered on law itself, but on based on other facets of understanding. Now, one of the uh, features which has come about as a result of this Ayodhya uh, uh, judgment, as a result of uh, uh, as, as, as a result of the Bhumi Puja, as a result of the Prime Minister's active participation in the event, has called into question various other things. And the question which has been raised is that an extraneous element has been added into the, for, in, into the manner in which our Republic has functioned. The belief that the constitution of India, as broadly formulated in 1950, was the be-all and end-all of everything, was a belief which certainly marked a lot, the, which marked the interventions of a lot of people, and that everything was going to be judged on the basis of the constitution. A new term, but actually it's not very new, it was new in the Indian context, also came into play at this particular point in time. And that was the notion of what is called constitutional patriotism. Now, I think it's important to go into that because that's a term which is being very, it's, it's being bandied about very, very generously at, 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 at present. And what does this term? This term has a very interesting history. Those of you who uh, uh, bother to uh, uh, look into the rather checkered history, the intellectual history of what constitutes the European Union today, would find that this term actually emanated from the writings of a very uh, uh, accomplished German political philosopher, Jürgen Habermas. Habermas was the person who looked at it and he sort of in the context of a post-national identity which he tried to form. And according to him, the European Union constituted the suprastate, suprastate which would reverse the entire history of bloodshed, war, conflict, strife, 
religious schisms, etc., which have characterized the history of Europe for many centuries, and not least the two very, very uh, damaging world wars which uh, of the 20th century. In particular, this had an appeal to a certain section in Germany. And that reason for that is also quite obvious, that Germany had been, had experienced a very, very troubled history after, it, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, a, a thinking which had been marked by first the World War I and followed by the very traumatic experience of fascism in, in, in that country, whereby Germans felt that they'd been shamed into a state of permanent shame in front of the whole world, not least because of the Holocaust and the, the treatment which marked their, 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 their sort of treatment, their, their uh, genocide of the Jews. Now, under these circumstances, what Habermas was trying to propose was that 1945, or rather the enactment of the constitution in Germany in 1948, the new constitution, the post-war constitution, would be, in effect, the year zero. That there would be no prehistory which would dominate it at all. And that, therefore, these sort of values which were um, emphasized by the constitution would come to define the German state. And that therefore, if this model was replicated all over Europe in the form of the European Union, those national identities, whether it be of Britain, whether they be of France, would gradually recede into the background and be subsumed by a new form of more juridical uh, identity whereby popular sovereignty would be redefined in a different sort of way. So the rule of the enlightened few bureaucrats actually come to define what the state is going to be. And this has been uh, at the heart of conflicts in uh, Europe. It's, these conflicts have surfaced as an as increasingly the European Union moves from being a mere economic trading bloc into becoming something which is called the federal Europe, you find a very robust argument which is taking place, a very exciting, I mean, I, I, I find that a very, very, some, sometimes very exciting arguments which have been taking place in, in Hungary, with the European Union on the meaning of where does Christianity as a form of values in defining Hungarian society and how it has come into conflict with what is the European Union calls its, its values. Similar sort of uh, similar uh, conflicts have been taking place in Poland. There have been conflicts taking place on the question of immigration in various uh, Indian parts. In Britain, you had a fundamental rejection of the European Union based on, I would say, a combination of aspiration and nostalgia. It was both taken together. Aspiration, because they felt being fettered by certain uh, restrictive practices and uh, uh, the, the idea of globalization as it was translated into the European Union, I um, mean, into the, the United Kingdom. And in the sense of nostalgia, insofar as believing that the greatness, the inherent greatness of Great Britain was being underplayed by these sort of trends in society, a degree of cosmopolitanism, which was now widely prevalent. A set of enlightened people who understand the values of the Republic as it is supposed to be, that popular sovereignty must necessarily be kept under check and modified and molded to suit a, a measure of enlightened cosmopolitanism. And this is the assumption on which uh, 
the whole movement for constitutional patriotism, which is now surfaced in India, is based on. I think it's important in this context to understand what role does the constitution have in this country. At one level, I believe that the constitution is very, very important. It's very, it's, 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 it's a seminal achievement of India that it managed to craft a constitution of its own in 1950. And then by and large, with some modifications and amendments which are necessary with that small measure of flexibility, these constitutional uh, values have kept going. And they have defined the rules of public life. And that's important to realize it that the role of the constitution fundamentally has been to define the rules of the public life, to actually set the Lakshman Rekha of what is permissible and what is impermissible in this context. What the, what the constitution does not do, and I emphasize this point, what the constitution does not do its constitution does not define, and in fact, it cannot do so, define the parameters of nationhood. The struggle in Ayodhya was basically an attempt. And that, that, that's the reason why I brought up this question of why did a very local dispute suddenly acquire a national dimension? What the constitution does not do is spell out the basis on which the nation has been crafted. And what Ayodhya sought to do, very unconsciously, and a lot of it might be called post-factor rationalization, what Ayodhya tried to do was that it sought a link to establish the linkage between antiquity, which I mean you know, the, uh, the belief in which the Ram was born at a particular spot to absolute the modern existence. That linkage had been lost by this emphasis on constitutional morality and constitutional patriotism. It's very interesting that the traditions of the national movement in India are twofold. On one hand, there was a constitutional struggle, which was marked by some very good interventions by people like uh, Srinivas Shastri, Tej Bahadur Sapru, earlier uh, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, the, the old fashioned constitutionalists who believed, and to some extent, even Muhammad Ali Jinnah in his early avatar, who believed that the progress of India will be defined in terms of its ability to acquire the constitutional virtues which had marked the United, which, which, which had marked Britain. And against that, there was a parallel streak. The parallel streak was those who sought to link India's urge for regaining sovereignty and that was what it was. You were trying to regain sovereignty after a long period of servitude, who tried to regain that sovereignty using symbols, using values, which predated the present, which went back a very long way, where imagery was conjured, a new, sometimes a new form of imagery was conjured, I believe Bharat, the construction of Bharat Mata, for example, which happened as a result of, which grew out of the inspiration provided by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's song in the 1870s, Bande Mataram, and which Aurobindo actually, Sri Aurobindo popularized and brought to the fore in a big way. These were some of the facets. The hero worship of Shivaji, for instance, was a factor in this. What Swami Vivekanand called let the whole nation echo to the same spiritual tune, the very words he used, the same spiritual tune, 
What he meant by this was that go back. Go back to what is your inheritance and use that as the basis of the new patriotism. So the linkage between the old and the new, which was so much there, which Lokmanya Tilak, for instance, tried to use in forms of popular mobilization, using the old in a modern idiom was there. So that tradition had gradually receded into the background. And that tradition was brought up. In the process, naturally, larger questions of history were also sought to be addressed. It is my personal view that had the Ayodhya movement, when it surfaced in the 1980s, and the claims of a temple having been broken down to make way for the Babri Masjid, not been met by a, by steadfast a policy of steadfast denial on the part of so-called historians, so-called academics, etc., that we may have seen that ambiguity in that structure actually persist in this day. That I believe that the determination for that demolition, which was so marked on the 6th of December 1992, would not have been so profound. That determination was caused, was occasioned by this complete stubborn denial to acknowledge that the collective that the common sense, the collective memory of India told of a tale of widespread iconoclasm, temple vandalism, and that these had to be somehow spoken about and negotiated within the framework of a modern multi-religious society. And its denial to even acknowledge that actually drove a lot of people to extreme action. But that's a personal view of mine. I believe that the manner in which we have tried to negotiate our own history has not been uh, very upfront and honest. And that in, the, in that sense, what Ayodhya does is it reopens that question and lays it open for a different forms of intervention, which keeps it in mind. So the issue of pop popular sovereignty is very, very important. The question of how we negotiate history is very important. And the question of where we attach importance to, to the Constitution. The Constitution exists as a body, as a work, which determines the rules of play for public life. But Ayodhya willy-nilly has become, and when the temple comes up, and that's why probably Narendra Modi very quite uh, astutely spoke about it as a symbol of modernity. What he meant, of course, and he, left, he didn't elaborate on this point, but what he meant was that this was becoming, in, in some ways, a symbol of nationhood which complements rather than contests the constitution. And that nationhood and the juridical process are not necessarily the same. And that democracy can often be enriched by the, uh, by the expression and articulation of popular sovereignty as we know it. So that coming, the, in, the linkage between that and the independence struggle, which he drew in a speech at Ayodhya, was also a manifestation of that, that we are, as a modern state, defining ourselves in civilizational terms, not merely in juridical terms. And in civilizational terms, we are talking about an unbroken thread which stretches from antiquity to modernity. To me, this was the, these were the important lessons of the Ayodhya. Yes, there might have been some more ugly manifestation, there might have been some more, uh, there may, may have been uh, other expressions, but the important thing for it is to draw out what will endure once the passions have subsided 
and how people will look back upon it in, in days to come, in the decades to come, as to why, what signified this great change. And it was, to my mind, a momentous change. It was not so much a break, but it was an enrichment. The term which uh, Macron then used was the new republic. Yes, it is a new republic insofar as I think we have added a new dimension to nationhood, which had been left dangling and almost as ambiguous as the history of the Barbary structure for so long. Thank you very much. Yes. Unmute my mic before clapping, otherwise no one will hear. Uh, thank you, thank you, Shapanda. Uh, that was quite riveting, and at uh, certain points, I thought uh, uh, there were, it was so nuanced and complex that uh, I really uh, found myself, uh, uh, you know, uh, not only enjoying uh, the uh, presentation, but it made me reflect deeply. So we will have questions. Please send it by chat to me, and I will read them out. But uh, I was just struck by how it seems to me that you were implying that popular sovereignty and constitutional patriotism uh, were somehow being reconciled at Ayodhya, uh, just as uh, you know, a mythic time, a mythopoetic time and imaginary before uh, modernity and history. And the damages and ravages and demands of history were also being somehow conciliated in Ayodhya. And thirdly, I felt that uh, you made the very important point that the kind of strangulation, uh, a, a, a very deterministic model of hard secularism uh, was banishing the ancient uh, constitution of India uh, in the name of its modern constitution, which which created the deep sense of unrest and dissatisfaction of the, uh, you know, uh, populace of India, uh, in whom vests the country's sovereignty, the nation as a cultural entity, if you will, with what we were uh, always brought up to believe was an Eruvian consensus based on the three pillars of secularism, socialism, and non-alignment. And it would seem that the new republic is actually uh, a signal that uh, those three pillars of our national consensus, which were in some ways undergird by the state religion uh, of secularism, were no longer adequate to define who we were. So with those remarks, uh, somebody, uh, please, uh, please send your questions. Uh, 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 Someone has said, did I understand right that the making of our constitution? Well, that is an incomplete uh, question, I think. But uh, uh, yes, so we throw this open. Anyone can send me their question uh, and uh, it'll be shared with others via chat. Go ahead. Uh, okay, here it is. Uh, the question is that was our constitution modeled on Western modernity and did it undermine the cultural and uh, fragility of India at the time of independence? So was our constitution, you know, uh, overly, it would seem, Western in its orientation? I mean, I personally feel that when I read uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar's last book, which was published posthumously, The Buddha and His Dham Dharma, he writes that, uh, you know, the real constitution of India is Dhamma. He says that in that book. It's in a footnote, actually. But in our constitution, the word Dharma is totally absent. So maybe the question is, uh, did uh, the emphasis on Western modernity undermine uh, our own, or, or emphasize our own cultural fragility at the time of independence. Go ahead. That's one. Well, it's a very, uh, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. The question, the issue to my mind is, 
what was supposed to be the role of constitution is it the it's the constitution as i see it always merely a document to spe- it's it's really the rules of the game it's really a rule book it's telling you how you conduct yourself in public life what are the norms for elections what are the separation of powers between the states and the center these are basically essentially juridical yeah. constructs these have to be defined if you don't want a state of permanent tension and anarchy but when it came to constitutional what what is today called constitutional morality and you quoted ambedkar dr ambedkar is saying it's the top dressing really it's the gloss underneath it is a different fall whether you call it dhamma whether you call it other forms of civilizational values whether you call it the eternal values these are sometimes impossible to codify i wouldn't like the idea of dharma dhamma to be codified i wouldn't like the idea of what constitutes sanatan dharma to be codified and that essentially became the problem a document an important document whose purpose was precisely to regulate the conduct of public life in india was sought to be transformed into a defining document of indian life in its totality so it was not so much the fault of the constitution as what people interpreted the importance of the constitution to be what the britain what britain is called the ancient constitution for example by on on which the entire notion of common law is based is is a series of precedents it's very rarely if ever codified the moment they started trying to codify it they've, they've got into all sorts of problems even now we witnessed some of the uh, the interventions of the supreme court of uk which earlier it was the privy council in the house of lords uh, now the attempt on the question of the brexit and whether parliament should sit or not you know the sovereignty of parliament was a facet of common law i mean a very famous example used to be given has the parliament got the right to legislate that all blue eyed babies <laughs> should be drowned the answer is yes they have a right but the question equally was put but will the parliament ever do such a thing now that was the british notion of sovereignty as thing and that's something which has come about through a long process of struggle began in the magna carta went down to the civil war the, uh, the revolution of 1688 the reform acts you've gone through this entire history which is encapsulated with is what is called the ancient constitution now we to have an ancient constitution it's not called the ancient constitution we have certain we have a certain body of customary law we have certain other facet which are whose relationship to the constitution of india is tenuous and i think here yeah, when conventional wisdom community wisdom as i call it as in 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 in, an, in in my book community wisdom offends what is called modern morality or cosmopolitan morality that has to be handled with kid gloves it is it is a fact it has to be handled with kid gloves and that's the really the process of democracy how we see it it's not that you shoot these people it has to be handled with kid gloves exactly well the questions have started pouring in now something triggered it and uh, the next question is actually on popular sovereignty and what you mean by it and it just struck me as you were talking that when we think about the notion of england uh, how can we have the idea of england without uh, the idea 
or the figure of King Arthur. You know, he's like Ram Chandra, you know, King Arthur and his knights and the round table, or even Robin Hood. I was remembering when, when you were talking about this movie, uh, where, which stars, I think, Russell Crowe as Robin Hood. And then, you know, they come back from the Crusades and King John promises certain things and then betrays his promise. And uh, Robin Hood becomes an outlaw. And what he invokes is this idea of popular sovereignty, that the common law, I mean, the, the ancient constitution is even more uh, legitimate that, than the so-called word of the diktat of the king. Anyhow, but the, the question here is, uh, could you please elaborate more on popular sovereignty? The first question was by Dr. Alkatiagi, and this question has come to us from, uh, well, the handle is called Vidya, uh, Vidya Dhar Shri. Anyhow, yeah, please. Yeah, please, could you elaborate on the idea of popular sovereignty? This is our, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, national fellow who has asked uh, 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 this this question, Professor Dataram Uroheji. Uh, go ahead, Shopanda. Yeah, uh, of course, it would have been so much better if, if uh, people were allowed to ask their questions themselves, because I think there's a certain passion which comes with the questions. And that, that, that passion is often lost when you actually key in a, a few words, you know, it's, it becomes a bit too clinical, but I'm, I'm sure the, you know, the, the, uh, the whole thing about popular sovereignty. Yes. Now, it's, it's always like most things, it's not something which you're going to express through um, uh, you know, election or through a referendum or something like that. The notion of popular sovereignty again here is is, is a construct which by which we actually take into account that the assumptions, the feelings, the impulses of a great majority of the people are taken on board. And what popular sovereignty actually, to my mind, is more important is by juxtaposing it to what it is, what I think is the other side. The other side is the belief that a body of enlightened people will sit in judgment over everyone else. And whether they be judges of the courts, whether they be someone else of equal authority, etc., or the intelligentsia, they will sit in judgment and prescribe what is right and what is wrong. And they will set the standards on which life, popular life, political life, cultural life is to be regulated. You know, there's always, uh, uh, each time the Ramayan, you know, the televised version, about the televised version of the Ramayan is shown and it can be quite kitschy, you know, it, um, it, it, it might offend our sense of aesthetics to a very large extent, you know, it's quite fancy those arrows, <laughs> you know, a lot, lot of gimmicky stuff, etc., which come in and, uh, and that's probably in, in a more refined sort of high culture sort of way, look, we'll say, look, this is not what the Ramayan is. But there is a popular transmission of how that Ramayan filters down, and it's hugely popular. I mean, this time there was a, I mean, there's no question about it, that entire lockdown process, I think, became tolerable to a very large section of rural folk and even a lot of urban folk because they could see the Ramayan all over again. So that's a thing of popular culture. And the whole notion of popular sovereignty here came about, comes about. And this belief of was this Ram, Ram Chandra's birthplace. Now, you may be strictly right in saying, what's your proof? Or as some people say, did you have a birth certificate to demonstrate that he was born in this? Now, local belief. Now, the entire history of in, uh, India, the, the, the entire geography of India is dotted with places which are which have a reputation as being one of the sacred sites of the Ramayana or even the Mahabharata. The Pandas rested here for two days. 
this is the place where such and such thing happened, where Bali or Sugri fought. Um, this is the Gandhamadan actually as it really existed in Sri Lanka. You find a place, you find a place where in Sri Lanka where it is said Sita was kept incarcerated. You have these. Now, some of these are legends based on subsequent interpretations, some of their, their versions of popular tourism in, sub, in, in an earlier age. Uh, but the entire sacred geography of India, why do we in, in Bengal worship Kali Ghat? Is one of the limbs of Lord Kali, I mean, the goddess Kali, was thrown there. Kamakya, which is supposed to be, you know, so important, you know, the, 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 the red which comes out is supposed to be the menstrual blood. The popular sovereignty in this case is when the reconciling of beliefs and impulses and the larger constitutional order, and that, that's what I'm talking about, takes place, the political order. And when the dissonance happens, that's where you have convulsions. To Robin Hood, good example. Now that was linked to two things. One, the notion of the nomad, which was there, which was supposed to be alien. And secondly, a, a romanticized, if, an idyllic belief in the ancient constitution, which must prevail. That was, you know, so that we see that as a very nice example of, uh, of, of, of this sort of thing. Now, in India, I think what, where we, I, one of the uh, problems, they let me underline this, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I elaborated. One of the features of the Indian constitution, which is there in the Indian constitution, in the directive principles of the Indian constitution, is this thing called the scientific temper. Now, I've always taken a great deal of objection to this, personally. Not because I don't necessarily believe that scientific, that you know, the cultivation of sciences is an illegitimate pursuit. It's not. I mean, all. I mean, we we have to cultivate the sciences. But when it says the implicit manner in which it's been interpreted is that the rational criterion <laughs> must determine everything in public life and your judgment on things. Now, there are large arenas of a human existence which are not rational, which cannot be defined by the norms of rationality as we know it. It's like suggesting when some people talk about the enlightenment values, now, I personally say that, look, my preference is towards the county enlightenment. Uh, but I say that more out of an impish sense of humor. But, uh, uh, but that, that's precisely what I mean. That the term scientific temper has been used, has been constructed in such a way as to make certain beliefs, faiths, etc., impulses illegitimate. And that's where the problem, again, has arisen. This schism. And this is an art contrived schism between modernity and tradition. It's completely contrived. Because it needn't be there. So I, 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 I hope I've given a sort of, I mean, the, ultimately, you know, I, I leave it to some uh, accomplished political scientist to write a treatise on popular sovereignty and how it can be uh, interpreted within the Indian context. No, but I think you, you, you did explain it very well because it does seem that the uses to which things like scientific temper uh, and uh, secularism or constitutional morality are put, uh, these you know, very lofty ideas are used to delegitimate the very sentimental spine which Renan and others said was was a nation, and uh, you know then uh, what the people, the so-called simple folks believe is considered unripe cognition, and uh, you know uh, 
a, a small set of people will then adjudicate and then use the might of the state, you know, to brutally suppress those and their, uh, you know, sentimental or uh, outpourings of their uh, outrage, uh, you know, with the draconian, as it were, heel of the whatever rule of law uh, with all the might of the state. So I think I think what you you've explained it at least in ways which was which were very clear to me. The next is as I expected on constitutional morality, and the question is from Professor Chahel. He says. Uh, Dr. Das Gupta in his lecture looks somewhat paradoxical in his whole debate on Ayodhya. What Ambedkar meant by this phrase in the constituent assemblies debates was totally different. He used the term in relation to the rights of future generations. That's the question. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think there's always a big debate on what Ambedkar said and what he meant. And, you know, we, we can get into a very theological discussion on what the actual meaning of Ambedkar is. I mean, I mean uh, the, the larger issue is what do we mean by uh, constitutional morality and also the notion of constitutional patriotism. And, and, both, uh, and both of them derive from the things that are certain derivatives which you take from the constitution and said these are the values which they contain and from there it deduces and we make it we make the conclusion that this is these are the things which are permissible and these are the things which are impermissible and i think that's really where the problem uh, often arises because these are not issues which can be necessarily uh, adjudicated by law, by, by, by a set of, uh, by a set of codification. Now, Burke once said uh, uh, something which he spoke about the, uh, the, the uh, political system being a, a contract between the living, the dead, and the unborn. And I think that often it, it sort of, uh, it sort of, to my mind, it brings out what, what I consider the ideal, an attempted ideal. I mean, I, can, I don't think anybody can get to the thing. That yes, we are talking about a future generation. We are talking about a previous generation. We are also talking about an inheritance. We are talking about ourselves as we exist in this moment. And we are also talking about people who we want to bequeath this country to. So we take all three into account. And this whole notion of consti what calls constitutional morality is not something we use casually. And nor do we put a definite stamp, nor do we, uh, nor do we uh, cloud it with an air of finality and certitude. The idea of certitude sometimes <laughs> is deeply problematic as far as anything in concern in politics itself. There is nothing which is permanent in politics. It's all conjunctural in a lot of ways. The, like, for instance, the experience of uh, Confucius in China is a very telling issue. You know, how Confucius being the sort of presiding philosophy of one at one time was trampled underfoot by Mao, who somehow waged a recurring battle against Confucianism only for the present dispensation in China to actually highlight the virtues of Confucian thing. So these are sort of things which go in cycles. These are, we shouldn't be governed by contemporary fashion. I think this is something which is very, very uh, thing in, uh, which, which I think is, important and this is where the element of continuity the element of restraint the uh, one of the features of the indian joint family system for example what it 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 did among a lot of things it was said that indian joint family system was based on um, a, a sense of suppression of individual voices. Yes, to a large extent. It was based on hierarchy. Yes, it was based on hierarchy. But it also constructed for a lot of people the notion of self-discipline, the importance of restraint. 
and that that sense of restraint in public life is very very important and that restraint can only come about by taking these three factors the living the dead and the unborn into account uh, i have a question uh, uh, just, pro professor raju just one second if you don't mind okay i'm sorry we lost a bit of the audio but uh, there there's another question in between if you don't mind it, it we go in order and then i hand it to you professor raju so this question was uh, is from uh, professor rajvi sharma and he's asking whether the ayodhya movement shows the uh, importance of cultural nationalism and whether uh, just constitutional patriotism or constitutional morality are sufficient uh, you know isn't it that the ayodhya movement uh is a, is an inflection point because it recognizes that without cultural nationalism the idea of india is incomplete and he elaborates on that he says that india is not merely a state it is a nation it means that the framers of the constitution were more than sure about india being a nation and that's why they didn't uh, emphasize the cultural nationalism aspect because they believed that it was already already inherent and the first copy of the constitution i remember had these beautiful etchings of the ramayan all over it so please that's the question yeah I, I, yeah i i think you're right and i think the example you give about the implied sense of nationhood which was there in the which which the constitution makers they didn't need to debate it it was there it just come out of a hugely popular they come out of an experience of a long struggle to regain national sovereignty and for them that was given what they wanted to do was to set up the norms of public order and public life so their priorities were very different and therefore what exactly happened and why this has suddenly acquired importance is what took place after 1976 and that's why i place that to be a very important it's an important milestone in in that, in that sense where this schism was sought to be established between the constitution and defi and nationhood and nationhood being reduced to the constitution earlier it was well recognized and i think the professor is right in suggesting that the forms of cultural nationalism which were manifest in various forms of the freedom struggle Hey, look at if you look at the entire forms of mobilization which took place, the time, the speeches of the Congress leaders during the Sera, for example. I mean, there, there are examples right from 1900 right down to 1946 or 47. You'll find, you know, how the in the imagery which was put in there. It was very easy that the construction of what is going on today was linked to this larger battle against ravan although i've never understood why kumbhakarna has to be uh, among the uh, people who <laughs> did i mean he did no harm to anybody um, but anyway uh, uh, so the so this 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 cultural thing was very much a part of how we mobilized and those who talk about this entire uh, who tried to reinterpret the national movement as something which was so very clinical and uh, emphasized class etc etc just to get how the actual mobilization took place on the in in on on the ground and there was more to the national movement than the ideas and thoughts of jawaharlal nehru There was much more to it. I mean, that is something I think which all this—the the reinterpretation of history, the manner in which sort of codification was done—all contributed to, to the point where it was. It became necessary to re-establish the nation, nationhood, as a principle of our Indian existence. 
Thank you. Last question to Professor C.K. Raju, and he will speak in his own voice. Go ahead. Well, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. You have given a um, uh, well, lot of material for uh, uh, people to think about. But my question is a little bit tangential. What, according to you, is the role of temples in Hinduism? There were no temples in the time of the Upanishads or in the time of the Ramayana or in the time of the Mahabharat or even in early India. So what, according to you, is something which makes this so central to Indianness? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, whether temples existed or not in the time of uh, Mahabharata or uh, Ramayan, I, I'm, I've never known what the time of the Upanishads is. Uh, yeah, but uh, with, with, uh, yes, it's quite in, entirely possible that worship was undertaken in different forms. But it's undeniable that over the centuries, temples have become, have evolved and have become a crucial feature of Indian existence in some way or the other. Good or for bad, it's fact that our ancestors at some point invented the temple. They were not the first ones to do it. Other civilizations have done it in their own ways. That a sacred place was kept aside in the community and deemed sacred for that. And that was what the role of the temples were. The importance of temples also came about because after about the ninth century or so, the uh, the manner in which conquest in India was often defined was uh, brazen acts of iconoclasm. Hence, the temple acquired a certain significance in the minds of a lot of people. Uh, 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 for them, it was the loss of the temple which gave the temple an additional significance sometimes. You'll have to read, if you read uh, Nirad Chaudhary's book on Hinduism, it's a quite, quite interesting because he quotes a Dutch traveler, I think a Jesuit traveler, I'm sorry, a Jesuit traveler of the 16th century going through various parts. And he said that all he noticed as he was going through various parts of Northern India were you know, just diyas in various odd places here and there. And when he went there to investigate what they were, and he found that they were actually ruins of temples, of the sacred space which had been denied. So often the importance of temples came about, A, partly because of a sense of inheritance, Maybe a sense of commerce too was in, in southern India and in, in, in some places because they financed a lot of the uh, merchant uh, of, of, uh, in, 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 in the south. But also the loss, loss of a temple also became quite important in symbolic terms and had a larger, it acquired a larger political meaning. Therefore, I would say that yes, maybe in antiquity, it's just like the entire question of uh, whether beef, for example, I mean, that's a, you know, whether beef was eaten in India or not. I don't know. It may have been for ceremonial occasions for a big, big, big thing. But over the centuries, it took, acquired it a different notion. So rather than saying beef is, uh, uh, I mean, one way of looking at it is that the cow is sacred. Another way of looking at it is that it is not customary for Indians to eat beef. That there is a popular, that there exists a certain, in a lot of communities, a certain revulsion towards eating beef. It's a very small issue, really, if you really look at it in, 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 in a big way. Whether it's sacred or whether there is a revulsion to beef. Whichever way you want to look, look at it, you can look at it. Therefore, the question of temples, again, is that like a lot of sacred places, and you, you can uh, look, look, look not only the, uh, the issue of uh, Indians, I mean Hindus, or what, constitute, what, what are called Hindus, but communities such as the Jewish, you know, the Temple of Mount, which I spoke about, this great temple constructed by Solomon, which was demolished, and which plays such an important role in the collective imagination 
of the Jewish community. It plays such a such an important role. The uh, I mean, these things can be multiplied. The entire issue of the, Re the Reformation, where you tried to re reverse a certain set of beliefs. Successfully or not is another matter altogether. But it's not something uniquely Indian, although we love to think of ourselves as very unique in a lot of ways. Uh, it, it's not a manifestation of Indian exceptionalism, nor is it a manifestation of uh, Indians having lost their inheritance and that we, we, we must reclaim the true inheritance in, in, in some way. So what is true or what is contrived, I think, is something. But it is a reality today. And uh, we can, uh, we needn't contest the notion of the sacred space. It exists. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add a footnote uh, about temples and how far back they go. There's so much disagreement. But when I went to Gurdi Malam, which is not too far from Tirupati, I was told that that was the first, uh, one of the earliest, uh, you know, uh, Shivalingas going back to the current era or a couple of even hundred years before the current era. So I think they go way back. So, to, you know, 2000 years of cultural memory uh, cannot be wiped out by uh, Arya Samaj reformist type of appeal to something even prior to that when we probably worshipped out in the open. But I think the, the idea of sacred space was so important. Uh, whether it was in Kamakya or elsewhere, where the shrines were erected on top of natural, uh, even Jwalamukhi here, an eternal flame, which was a natural phenomenon. Uh, and so I think that's it's that notion of sacredness in the universal, uh, you might say, interchange of energy and interconnectedness. And I'm reminded, uh, as a last thing, about Raja Rao's new book, The Meaning of India, where he basically says that Hindus are very ahistorical. What he means by that is that whenever they get a chance, they will try to replicate something that they believe existed at some point in the future. So it doesn't matter 500 years are gone or 1,000 years are gone. As soon as situations are conducive, they will try to replicate that idea. And for him, Ram Raja was the marriage of wisdom and power. He says whenever Hindus acquire a certain, uh, you know, you might say bent strength, they will try to replicate that arrangement. So it's an interesting idea that, uh, you know, uh, as long as Radha Rao is implying that, you know, as long as, uh, uh, you know, as even a small community of people who have some Shraddha for Ram exist, then you break the temple, doesn't matter, they'll go and light a lamp somewhere, just to, just to say we haven't forgotten. And uh, I'm also reminded of... Uh, what happened in, in Istanbul, where the Hagia Sophia, which is a beautiful, beautiful 4th century, 5th century shrine uh, of uh, what was called the Eastern Rome, the, the Byzantine Empire, has now become a mosque once again. Uh, so it's also possibly a kind of inflection point in the, in the Turkish idea of secular, uh, uh, you know, uh, nationalism being uh, superimposed by some sort of uh, reassertion of popular sovereignty, perhaps. You know, it just makes us think about how these things are playing out in different parts of the world. But I just wanted to say thank you all. Thank you, Shopanda. Uh, any last word from you? I'm going to hand it over to you, but not before saying that in better times, I hope you and Rishmiti can come and visit and spend some time with us here in Shimla in the Vice Regal Lodge, what used to be called the Vice Regal Lodge. And I'm very happy to say that the work of the renovation and restoration of this building, this astonishing building on the beetling brow of the local, of the lower Himalayas was started today. You know, uh, the repair work has been started today. After 1888, the first time we had, we had undertaken a comprehensive renovation of this uh, bit of our own heritage where the Radcliffe lines were drawn and the Doran line and the McMahon line and so forth. So we look forward to your presence in our midst in, uh, in more, more salubrious times, I suppose. But last words from you, and we do want your blessings and good wishes to continue our journey. Well, thank you, uh, Makran, and I'm so glad that I've uh, 
may been able to talk to you on the occasion of the restoration of what was once billed as the Balmoral in, in India. If you recall somewhere up near the staircase, you, you, you'll find the there once existed the coat of arms. Now you just only see the silhouettes of the coat of arms. You know the the uh, the fact that uh, maybe you it, it would be a very good idea if you can reclaim the coat of arms from Rashtrapati Bhavan, where I don't believe they're really being shown and given the due importance which are there. And uh, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you for the provocative uh, questions, which will make me think a little more about some of those things. And. Uh, all the best, and do get yourself a paid uh, Webex uh, uh, subscription because it's this free subscription which you go through, which is all right Absolutely. because of this fifty-minute thing. I think an I institute like yours can easily afford it. Absolutely, I've already signed the file. It's moving yes. through the. Well, it'll know. move its way. It'll move its way. It'll one day. <laughs> very soon, very soon, right. and we, we do have Lord Minto's arms. Uh, uh, you know, right down when we go, go towards our gardens at the back, when he was viceroy, he, I think, extended the gardens and his coat of arms, which is a variation of the British unicorn and the lion, they, they, we do have that. And uh, I, I completely agree that, uh, uh, you know, a building like this, so redolent with history and uh, in a way, I mean, with our constitutional as well as uh, popular sovereignty, and the dialogue between them needs to be preserved as Radhakrishnan wanted, President Radhakrishnan wanted, as a place for deep reflection and uh, free, uh, uh, unconstrained uh, uh, discussion on, on matters of human importance. Uh, and thank you, Shopanda. Thank you very much. Thank you for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.